So you all know each other, right? You, oh, okay. Raphael, Margaret. So good afternoon. We will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Kevin Clayton, and I'm Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement for the Cleveland Cavaliers. But I also have a great honor, and that is that the three GMs of our teams that asked me to lead the alliance, and the alliance, the three-team alliance, is where right after the George Floyd murder, the Indians, Browns, and Cavs came together, and we believe that our platform as a united front would be a lot stronger than the individual teams. And that platform now has actually begun to be duplicated across other communities outside of Cleveland. And for us, we're gonna talk today around the impact of, you know, how we can be the solution. And our panelists today are representing the Browns, the Indians, and we also have an amazing woman with us and representing us from a from the Y, and that's Margaret Mitchell with the YWCA. So what we'll do is we'll do a quick introduction, if maybe you can take a minute just to explain who you are and what you do, and then we'll jump right into the conversation. So Margaret, my mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother taught me always women first. <laughs> so if you don't mind kicking us off. I don't mind at all. My name is Margaret Mitchell, and I'm president and CEO for 10 years of YWCA Greater Cleveland. Our mission is and has been eliminating racism and empowering women, and we are bolder today. Over the last five years, we've grown bolder, stronger, clearer, and more on, on point, on purpose around um, our mission. So really excited to be here with you, Kevin. All right. Thank you. Mr. Brewer. Yeah, Ron Brewer here uh, in my sixth season with the Cleveland Browns uh, as the director of player engagement. Uh, my focus is really to help our players and as well as our entire team uh, grow and develop in areas outside of football. Um, a lot of educational programs, um, including financial education, uh, that we do to help our players transition both in and out of the NFL. Okay. Raphael. <clears throat> I'm Raphael Collins. Uh, I am with the partnerships team here at the Cleveland Indians. Uh, this is my 10th season, so I work with a, a large list of partners on uh, how to best use marketing tools to speak, uh, engage, and activate with uh, our fan base. Okay, well, great. I I'm gonna start by reading a quote in which Andrew Berry, right after the George Floyd murder, uh, actually, it was his statement, and I know for the Browns, that began a lot of energy and, and movement, um, but I'm gonna ask all three of you to respond with, whether or not you think professional sports teams have a moral imperative to lead in this conversation around social justice and racial justice. So the quote is, I think I have the quote here. NFL teams in general have such an influence on their communities that if we can't be at the front of the pack on some of these issues that, that impact us all, then shame on us. NFL teams in general have such an influence on their communities that if we can't be at the front of the pack, shame on us. Ron, let me start with you. What do you think about that? Do you think we have the pro teams have the uh, moral imperative? Yeah, actually I do. Um, I think with you think about the word influence um, and you're looking to have a positive influence on something that our society needs as a whole. Uh, well, when you have a sports team uh, like the Browns, the Indians, the Cavs, and you can reach a number of individuals, well then you should use that platform. Uh, because 
what we do on Sundays or Tuesdays or whatever day, you know, the, the fans are watching and, and everybody's wearing our, our colors, um, that's one part of it. Uh, but the other part of it is the people that we can touch and reach and just improve the society as a whole. And so when you have that platform, I, I do think it's important to use it. Uh, we look at our athletes the same way. Um, that's what I teach our guys. Um, the draft is going on now. And when we have these new guys coming in, one of the things I've talked to them about is how can we use our platform to move society um, in a positive direction? And so, in my opinion, I do. I, I think it's something that you know, when you can move the needle with the number of people that you can touch, uh, you should use that platform. Okay, thank you. Margaret Mitchell, what do you think? Oh, I think the, uh, you know, I think the professional teams have, always have. Um, you know, there was a pretty good player for the Browns <laughs> who was an amazing voice um, and is an amazing voice. And so I think we've always looked and have understood um, the influence. I think it had, has been dormant at times over the years. And it is really uh, wonderful to see the, the, the strength and the, and the power of, of the teams coming to fruition again. Certainly, um, you know, I grew up in California. And so I am partial to California sports teams. I'm just going to say that, uh -oh. um, as, as was my father. But my father always had this crazy, deep love for Bill Russell. And I had an opportunity uh, maybe eight years ago uh, to be in a small group of people um, and hear Bill lay it, all, lay, lay it out, <laughs> lay the history out. And it was just like, wow. He knew the moment. He knew the influence. He knew the power. And he knew the fans and how he could engage the heart. It's that heart muscle that really drives change. Policy and practices, all of those things have to come along, but athletes are able to drive that heart muscle and allow people to look at racial equity um, in new ways, in different ways to be seen. And it's a powerful, powerful tool. I'm so excited about the uh, partnership that you all have. So, so the pretty famous Cleveland Brown that you were referencing, are you talking about Jim Brown? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, yes, Absolutely. Jim Brown. So Raphael Collins, what do you think? So I'll give another take. Um, if, if people are looking for an example of, of kind of why Andrew's very quote is important, one thing I would say is if you look at our game just last night, um, the start of that took the field. Seven of our players, they were not born in America. It, if you're looking for a perfect example of, of why this stuff is important, that's the, the, one of the greatest examples of why, how teams can operate, how, how teams, you know, to perform at an elite level, uh, how you come together and, and achieve greatness from doing uh, things in units. And so I, I look at that, and over my tenure being with the Indians, I, I just remember over time celebrating uh, some of our players earning U.S. citizenship and their experiences, their life experiences up until that point. And so um, you, you have so many different people from so many different regions and so many different backgrounds. Um, it's, it's just a special moment, so. Thank you. So I, I want to offer a perspective from the Cavs, but more so from the NBA. And to your point, you know, Bill Russell always took a stand around this. So when George Floyd was killed, the NBA was very serious. Matter of fact, with all due respect to my, my colleagues, we made kind of the first statement, but it wasn't just around the words. What changed the axis of, of, of really what was going on from a social justice standpoint in this country was after that, when there was another killing, the players walked off the court and stopped playing in the summer league. And they stopped playing because one, it was like, how could we play? Secondly, we have to do something because here we are a few months after George Floyd, again, another African-American male was shot and killed by law enforcement. And I just feel very fortunate to work for an organization, work for leagues where our values stand above anything else. And we've had a number of sponsors, number of season ticket holders right here in Cleveland as well that were like, look, what, keep your politics in the locker room, we just want to see the players play. 
which is also going back to LeBron's statement around what, shut up and dribble? No, we're not doing that. And what I'm proud of is that this community has rallied around the three-team alliance. And it's not that we have the answers, but we just have a platform of which this community can, can actually connect to. Which leads me to another piece, Margaret, that I'm not sure if our audience knows of what you've done in this community and how the Three Team Alliance is connected to that. So it's been, I guess, a year or two, and please correct me on the, on the timing, where the city and county actually had proclamations and resolutions around racism being a public health crisis. The author, if you will, of that idea and concept is Margaret Mitchell. <laughs> so Margaret, can you talk about why that was important and connect the dots to kind of how we, the Three Team Alliance, can support that initiative? Uh, you know, I've, as I said before, I've been at the YWCA for 10 years and the first five years I would say that I was the imposter in chief. Uh, because our mission of eliminating racism and empowering women was not really being lived at its fullest. And a young man uh, by the name of Tamir Rice was adultified and murdered here in Cleveland. And I spent three days crying. It was the transference of being a black mother and seeing my son. And I just woke up one day and said, I'm not turning back, not turning back. So it began a journey, but in 2019, the YWCA and First Year Cleveland um, held a two-day summit to commemorate 400 years since the start of chattel slavery. Um, it really, 1619 isn't the start of slavery in America, but it's the start of sort of the powerful economic engine of chattel slavery. And so we held a two-day summit uh, with national speakers, and we decided that if we were gonna commemorate 400 years of inequities, we wanted to have a call to action at the end of that summit. And so our call to action was um, to declare racism a public health crisis. Uh, my colleague in uh, Milwaukee um, at the YWCA there had been part of their community work they were one of the very early communities to declare racism a public health crisis and so um, that's what we landed on as our call to action. And in 2019, we got a lot of eye rolling. There wasn't a lot of um, people understanding what the issue it was. Even then, public health was like, well, what is public health? And how does it tie to racism? And today, uh, through both COVID and our ability to see police violence, which talking about in 2019, we only had about 20 or 25 days where there was not police involved murders of black and brown people in a whole year. <laughs> and so we begin to understand how public health ties to all of this. And I think, you know, what we need from the teams is a partnership. We know that there must be players that have that are really tuned to social justice, and their voice, that partnership, really allows us to elevate the topic um, because their voices allow people to stop, listen, and understand. Young people can hear and learn, relearn what they're not learning necessarily in our old education system. I do believe the education system is changing. But there is a powerful voice uh, to be had and I'm so excited about it, so excited. It is the conversation, it is the action, it is saying a declaration is not enough. We need real change. What does that change look like? It looks like policy and practices in housing, education, criminal justice, um, the wealth gap, on and on. And, and that is, it's the partnership that is really needed. Thank you. Yeah, Ron? I think in, a, in bringing that magnitude of attention to this topic is important, and which is what you did by declaring it a public health crisis, right? Because you mentioned what the incident uh, and Tamir Rice did for you. 
And that's what it is for our players, right? They started seeing George Floyd as my potential uncle or my, you know, team member or somebody, you know, close to me. And so now it brings attention. Like, people start thinking about themselves and start thinking about, you know, this could be somebody that I know and close to home. How would I think about it if that was the case? Oh, I would bring a lot more attention to it than I have been. And I think that's what you've done, and that's what our players have the ability to do, our teams have the ability to do, is say, hold on, stop for a second. Like, this could really be somebody near and dear to you. How do we address it? And if we're not addressing it, then we're not doing what we need to do as a society. And so I, I just think what you've done and then empowering that with the teams brings the necessary attention to what we're trying to do here. Social justice is just as important as literacy or hunger. And it is so critically important for us to understand racial equity and its impact on everyone, on everyone. There is white racialized trauma. There is black racialized trauma. And there certainly is uh, police, blue racialized trauma that is out of control. And until we're able to really start talking about um, the pain uh, and trying to always hide the truth of what's happening, we're not going to heal. We're not going to get better. So, so when the three teams came together, we focused on three different pillars, one of which was education, as you referenced, and that was really with the focus on closing the digital divide. The other was voting, and it wasn't necessarily because there was a national election that was focused on uh, the presidential race. Voting is local. And like right now, the three-team alliance is focused on the mayoral race that's coming up, and then after that, the county chair, the county executive race the year after that. We also have a law enforcement pillar, and that is focusing on closing the gap between black and brown and other communities that have been somewhat oppressed by law enforcement and law enforcement. And Rafael, you sit on one of those three uh, sub-teams. Can you talk about the sub-team that you sit on and how you see the work of the three-team alliance relative to your sub-team connecting to what Margaret had referenced? Yeah, um, Margaret, when you start talking about the police trauma and, and having these conversations in the first place, um, one of the things that came top of mind to me was the conversations for change. Um, we just had our second iteration of that program yesterday and seeing all these young adults, all these young people so passionate, so courageous and so brave to have these type of conversations with our local police and law enforcement officers. And then to, to, to record to, you know, the law enforcement officers who came here, they had to be just as brave and, and they had to empathize and sympathize and um, to, to be a part of this type of program. And one of the things that kind of gives me hope is uh, coming into these different programs and leaving them. After our first one, uh, the young adults who were there, so these are ages 14 to 20, over 80% of them said, their perception of law enforcement had changed. And then coming out of that, the law enforcement officers, 100% of law enforcement that was there, they said they want to do this more often. And so that gave me a little bit of hope that these type of conversations, while they're tough and uncomfortable, that, that we need it and that both sides want to have it. Yeah, and, and to that point, if I can just add to it, Raphael sits on the law enforcement uh, sub-team. This room was completely full of young adults, kids, law enforcement officers, people were standing in the back, and the conversations were so rich that it was quite honestly, for me, a confirmation that our platform can actually make a difference. And I was speaking with two white law enforcement officers afterwards, and they, were, they said to me, they were so thankful to be here because they were hearing for the first time really what the fear is from black and brown kids. I'd probably also add, too, one of the interesting takeaways I had from just the initial conversations before we programming even started, the police, uh, we, we worked through a group called Noble, um, who represents a lot of different police uh, orgs in the state of Ohio and other chapters and states. And then we also work with some, some groups who, who represent young adults in this community. And both of them, they reached out to the Three Team Alliance, all of us, and said, we need your help. Sports can be the catalyst to bring us together. Can we use you? We all rally for you. We all cheer for you help us connect each other. And so um, it was just a beautiful process of how it came together and, and kind of how it's rolled out so far. Yep. So, so Ron, you also sit on one of the, one of the sub teams. So if you could share which sub team you sit on and kind of the work that your sub team's doing. Yeah, you mentioned voting. 
Um, and that was something that we really wanted to emphasize and focus on specifically uh, with the Cleveland Browns. Um, and we were able to get all of our players registered to vote, 100% of our players registered to vote um, for this past election. Uh, and, and, and again, as you mentioned, the mayor election and other elections, local elections are just as important that are coming up. Um, the voting aspect for me and, and for our team, it's just one of those things where you don't realize you, I kind of grew up with the idea that my vote didn't count, right? That was something that I thought of. And I can look at my players now who are younger and growing up with the same mentality, like, you know, my vote, my, what's my one little vote going to do? And so bringing that type of education to understand, like, no, it's not just one little vote, it's a collection of votes, right? And to get that image imprinted on our players' mind and then also put that out there for our millions of fans to see. So now if I can take this one section of individuals who've never voted before, and now I have 10 more votes, and that leads to 20 or 20,000 more votes. Like, that was something that we really wanted to emphasize. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to continue to need to grow, um, but even more so because there's more individuals that aren't registered to vote. But that's something that, you know, is one of those, like, pr like, like practical things that we could really put our hands on um, and actually, you know, move the needle that way. So voting was kind of where we, we started. And around voting, Rocky Mortgage Fieldhouse was a voting location, and it was really the first time that we had done that. It, not, it would not have happened if not for the three-team alliance. It now is a permanent voting location in downtown. We also had a voting registration event with all of our mascots, and, and post-COVID now, we may be able to have players that are down and others, but it was a party, quite honestly. We had DJs, and it was a party to encourage people to come down and register to vote. So, Margaret, the foundation that you laid, that's kind of the result out of it, at least from our perspective. And we've been together, what, seven months, eight months or so. But there's something else that you've done, and that is the 21-day challenge. Can you maybe share with our audience what that is, and maybe we can get some folks here to sign up for it? <laughs> so... As I, as I said, we began five years ago going on this journey, and uh, three years ago, almost four years ago now, we were looking for a racial equity professional development opportunity for our team, for our internal staff. And we identified uh, the 21-day racial equity and social justice challenge and identified that as a tool for our staff, our internal staff, and we started working on it and building it, and just before we launched it, you know, we had this idea like, hey, maybe a couple hundred people in the community might want to, you know, do the challenge with us, and so we opened it up to the community, and lo and behold, the first day we launched three years ago, 1,500 people had signed up, and on day 15, we had 2,500 people. Um, last year, um, we shared the challenge with other YWCA's and had about 30,000 people uh, doing the challenge. It is, it is a virtual platform. Every day for 21 days, you receive content. It's an e it is articles, podcasts, video clips, infographics, and we arrange it all around um, a different topic. Um, the first week this year was on reparations, which is a very powerful word. It's a word that scares a lot of people. And we felt like we just needed for people to understand what it is and what it isn't, how it's been used, where it's been used. And we see ourselves as we don't, we just sort of set the table, we set the buffet. And um, it, it's just an incredible tool. We, looked, we, we look at criminal justice, um, we, look at, we looked at environmental racism, we looked at gender-based violence, and we looked at sports and the impact that sports has had, a uh, positive impact sports has had uh, through a racial equity uh, lens. And it's just, a, it, it's just an amazing tool. And most people walk away really learning something that they didn't know um, or understand and it's the, the depth. And you yourself step in to um, ab ab obtaining this content. It is your own appetite. Um, and, you know, it takes 21 days to, to, 
to, to build a habit, and it does take 21 days to, we say, build a racial equity and a social justice habit. And so uh, that is the, the 21 day challenge, and it is getting ready to really grow next year. Can, can I digress for a moment? Yeah. What if we, the three team alliance, what if the Browns challenge the Indians? and the Indians challenge the Cavs, and then we challenge all of our other teams in the NBA, in the NFL, and Major League Baseball. Would that, would that help? It would, be, uh, it would be crazy. It would be, it would be so awesome. And, and you know, we think it's important to have a rich conversation um, and not trade in um, suspicion and myth, um, but to really be able um, the more we're able to have conversation, it's that dialogue that you, that you talked about and what it did. It's that thing. It seems so simple, but it is the real deal. Um, you know, in the 90s, the Genome Project proved that we are nine, that race is false. There are no, there aren't different races. We are 99.9% the same. And we, we got to talk. We got to engage. And that would be crazy. I mean, we would just like lose our minds a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, what, what do you think? I think we might know a few people who could probably help with that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. What do you think, Ron? Yeah, I agree. Right. So our senior, uh, our digital, our senior digital uh, manager, Paige, is here, and I'm sure she's having just a slight heart attack because she's responsible for all her. She and her team are responsible for all of the content, but she's she's like, I know she's saying let's let's bring it on at the same time. So and, and quite honestly, I'm not grandstanding. That's what these conversations, when we have them amongst our team, we meet every Wednesday, 1:30 to 2:30 as, what is it, 16 of us. The GMs meet every other Friday as well. And this has been going on for six, seven months. So this is just how, how we come to action and we'd love to do that. Wow, so okay. Let's fr we'll figure it out. Oh my gosh, I'm <laughs> a little overwhelmed. <laughs> Yep. So, you know, actually I had one of these, one of the questions was, was how does the CL3 seek to unite a community around a common cause? I think we just demonstrated that. Yeah. Okay. So let me turn back to the Be the Solution in Cleveland, which came from an internal email from Andrew Berry. And would would like to go to you, Brew, and just talk about what happened, how the process. So, and AB sends out an email, right? Take us from there. Yeah, so um, one thing about Andrew that I love is he's a, he's a GM, but he's, he's approachable. He's an individual. He's a human. Um, and Andrew, you know, understanding just kind of the opportunity um, that he had, put that email out there. Um, he saw it upon himself. You know, it was something that he felt like he wanted to do. Um, he sent the email out um, and really gave us something that we could all – rally around right um it's it's you got one player doing work over here you got one staff member doing work over here but when you kind of pull all of it together and you start to get everybody moving in the same direction um again that word influence you know it comes to mind and you can just hit so many people and so from there it was kind of like what you just did right we we start with something we can rally around and then what's the challenge right and so we challenged staff members, um, whether it was to read a book, um, whether it was to donate, um, to take, whether it was to register to vote, to take some type of action towards being a solution to really get the ball rolling. Because to be honest, we've heard this all our lives, but talk is cheap, right? But there is an aspect of communicating and having the dialogue. But from there, after you have the dialogue, there's work that needs to be done. And so from there, the challenge was issued for us as a staff, for our players, to do something um, over the course of the next couple of weeks and beyond um, that really started to place the emphasis on how we could be the solution in Cleveland. Wow. Yeah, can, can we join for an applause for that, please? That's, that's good stuff. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so Raphael, actually, I'm going to come to you now. What, what, did the, what did the Indians do in response? So um, maybe a series of different things kind of over the next few months after, but um, 
I, as I look here today, um, being May 1st now, and I just think about where we've come as, a, as an organization, uh, the conversations that are happening, I, I don't know if they would happen before 12 months ago. Um, and so we've had a series of, of optional, um, sometimes optional, sometimes mandatory, but conversations. And um, it's been deep discussions where we make sure it's safe spaces. And, and again, we make sure we provide all of our team with those same type of resources. I know Andrew it provided an extensive list of resources, which was like really cool. Um, but again, like these type of conversations that we're having again for the first time, these came from the top down. So that, that was important. Margaret, you, you mentioned earlier the power of people's voices. And so it's very, very um, prevalent that our, our business leaders and our, our baseball leaders here, um, they're very present and it's not just with their words but with their actions. Um, and, and some of these different conversations that, that I mentioned that we had, I've heard from some of my, my colleagues that say how these type of things have changed their lives. How, um, this is the education that they can't get in school. These, this is the education that, that, that wasn't allowed in the workplace before the past 12 months. And so um, that's just a, maybe a, a short cliff note of kind of what we've done over the past 12 months or so. Okay. So, so from a uh, Cavalier standpoint, and it kind of came on the heels when Andrew made his statement that kind of also went public, uh, our coach, uh, J.B. Bickerstaff, and our general manager is soon, right after George Floyd was murdered, they issued a statement and the statement was around how really they felt about it. Our organization rallied around that and we issued a total organizational statement, but it wasn't just about the statement because from that point forward, it really created the energy behind us taking an already established diversity, inclusion and equity program and building upon that for the moment. And the moment was how do we take this tragic event to make this a movement within our organization and some of the things in which we did do, very similar to what you said, from a reading club and materials of that nature. Any of you from Cleveland also saw the iconic LeBron wall, of which we have a campaign that actually has now changed from the, from the um, poster or the, the banner that was up there, the canvas, to the For the Love for the Land campaign. And the For the Love has to do with, we believe that the only way that we're going to have this change not only through conversation, but quite honestly, it's just love for each one, each other. And if we can't love our similarities and differences, we're always gonna be focused on the battle that is two sides butting heads because there's no conversation. And I really like what you said, the fact that if you take away skin color, you'll realize that 99.9% .9 of our DNA is about the same. The for the land is obviously who Cleveland is known for, the name Cleveland is known for. So we have built everything moving forward around that moniker, for the love, for the land. And that's everything that we do. So it, it went from the statement to now just a part of our culture on how we move forward. So as we come around the home stretch, which I guess today is Derby Day, so that's an appropriate phrase, right? <laughs> as we come uh, down the home stretch, and, and Margaret, I'm gonna ask you this question. As you look forward and think about Cleveland, you know. What's kind of your vision for for Cleveland coming together to fight social justice, racial justice? And you can reference or talk to the Three Team Alliance if that makes sense for you to connect the dots there as well, please. I, I'm so encouraged that you all are focused in on voting. Um, we had low vote, voter turnout in this last election and our census turnout was also low. And there are ramifications um, when you have a low census, um, and it is really going to be important over the next 10 years uh, to stay committed and dedicated to, um, to, to lifting up voting, and I'm gonna include the census in there. Um, I think that is just uh, one of the most powerful things that we can do. And you mentioned you felt as if uh, you didn't have agency, your vote didn't matter. And I think um, that is seen, that is felt, the lack of agency, that I am seen, heard, understood, that my vote matters. And so staying focused on that is going to be uh, game changing. Ron? Yeah, and again, I, I, I completely agree. Um, when you, you throw out the numbers, you still have low voting um, with how much we improved in terms of having voter turnout, um, like there's still work to be done, right? And so when you think about what 
further education we can continue to provide and also what strategic ways we can help people get registered to vote. Um, like I said, there's work to be done, right? And so there's a plan that needs to be instituted. And so that's what, again, we can come together and do. Like my mind right now as we're having these conversation is, and, and again, as you talk about as we're getting ready to close, like we literally have an opportunity to save lives, mm. right? Like, like that's something to me when I think about my family members, when I think about just friends, when I think about people out here, like these things actually translate into us saving lives. Um, whether it's through police officers who um, improve their training or whether it's through us as individuals who respond and communicate differently. Like we're saving lives through these conversations and providing this education. And to me, that's why it's important. And in the platform that we have, you know, again, like how many lives can we potentially save even though we might not see it, but it's happening. And so how many lives can we potentially save by registering the vote? Getting, if we get 20,000 more people registered to vote, that's a win, okay? So how can we improve on that? Those are lives that we're actually saving and changing. And, 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 and again, like I, I always say this word, moving the needle, um, because that's what, that's what we're doing. Okay, thanks, Ron. Raphael? I would say too, so, so I'm a native Clevelander, born and raised here, and um, I, I think for the majority of people that grow up in this town, like you're a Cleveland fan. You don't say, I'm a Browns fan, I'm a Cavs fan, I'm an Indians fan. You're a Cleveland fan. When you talk about how powerful like changing lives this is, this first time ever for all three of our orgs and soon to be w y YWCA, um, when, you, when you think about our collective effort and, and what we've done just to start, just to get the launch um, just over the past, you know, uh, past year or so, I'm looking forward to the future. I mean, we got so many different brilliant minds who operate these, these wonderful sports teams that uh, people rally and cheer on every single day. Um, the fact that we can change lives and we're doing it together, it's just gonna amplify the voice and, and amplify the difference that we can make in our community. So I'm gonna offer, I guess, my thoughts on that, and then I'm gonna come back to each one of you as we close out. And instead of looking inward, I'm gonna ask us to look outward and what is your one thing that our participants in the audience can do. Okay, so as, as you reference Ron around just the coming together and voting and what have you, I will tell you that last year, I have met more people of prominence and influence than I ever have since I've been in Cleveland. Because of the three team alliance, I have been on conversations with the governor representing our team, the attorney general, um, senators, our mayor, police chief, every really dignitary from a political standpoint, and that never would have happened, Margaret, if not for the power of sports. It, it never would have happened. And I understand why it happened. <laughs> it's simple. They translate our fans into votes. That's okay, because what we have to do is translate our fans into votes as well, and collectively kind of have a platform and leverage that. Because our fans kind of are an influence on kind of what our players and organizations think about. And that's really what we've done to talk about how we can influence change. So Morgan, if I can start with you, with our fans either online or in the audience right now, what can they do to help us in this journey? I would encourage you to be a racial equity and social justice champion by understanding that this will lift all boats. Cleveland is the largest poor city in America. We have two places to go from here, up or down. <laughs> we're already, you know where we already are. And we have an opportunity to understand what this, what this issue is and how racial equity and social justice is an economic engine that is going to lift all boats. And it is what this community needs in the worst of ways. And we are only going to be able to achieve that together. Okay. Ron? Yeah, I would say um, the biggest thing is to make this important to you. 
Um, and, the, and the reason I say that is because of what we've been talking about in terms of influence and then the word that we all use, the three team alliance, right? If you make this important to you, there's an area of influence that you have, whether with your family or on your job or in your relationships, like that type of alliance and you making it important to you and you impacting those people and then this person over here doing the same thing, like she mentioned, just lifting the boats, like there are a lot of different boats. And so you have an influence with your boat and the way to lift that is for you to make this important to you. Um, and because we've made it important, that's why we've started to have the conversation with the Attorney General. That's why we started to have a conversation with the mayor. Before, we didn't make it as important to us, so we didn't have those conversations. But as soon as we did, the phone rang and the meeting was made. And so when you make it important to you, those things start to take place and happen. So that's what I think. Thanks. Raphael, what's your advice to our audience? Uh, word comes top of mind to me is allyship. Um, and I just think about uh, just in general, um, everybody has their own life path, their own journey and experiences, education, all these different things um, can kind of guide y y your, your view, your perspective. And what I would say is, let's, let's challenge ourselves to learn other people's view and perspectives. And not just to learn and educate ourselves that way, but let's support them and let's understand that, that their path and their journeys may be a little bit different from ours. Um, but let's support each other, let's be there, let's, let's treat people like people, let's give everybody that respect. Um, and, and be like, force ourselves to be that ally for them. Okay. Yep. So, so in closing for myself, my hope is this, and here's a little bit of background. I grew up in Cleveland. The very, one of the very first jobs I had, quite honestly, was working at, as 17 year old intern down at Old Municipal Stadium. And I was, I worked at the Browns training camp when it was at Kent State. I was, watching baseball games as a loge attendant in Municipal Stadium and didn't work for the Cavs until I came back 35 years later. And the three-team alliance to me is its in my blood, quite honestly. I mean, that's all I know. I know our three teams. And my hope is that you all would join us, that you would join us on this journey and things such as, so what can you do? Last night was pride night for us in our building. And Margaret, the number of negative comments on our social media around why would we actually recognize the LGBTQ community, it was deplorable. So how could you join us? If you all see that, say something. Offer a positive response, if that's what you believe, around anything. Because when we made our statements around George Floyd, we got the same kind of feedback. So with that, Thank you, Margaret, Mr. Brewer, Mr. Collins, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you.